Okay, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace, and we just ask that you'll be with us this morning as we discuss um, kind of a focus on these end times <clears throat> that we live in, uh, knowing what's important and what you would have us to know and understand as well as to do. Uh, so we ask your uh, leading and guiding as we uh, discuss these verses today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so for those of you who are on the Zoom meeting, uh, again, if you it didn't make sense, maybe what I was mentioning, we have a group in Oregon at River's Edge Church uh, that is joining us. I, I think it's their, I don't know if it's their church or Sabbath school time, but anyway, whatever group they have gathered around, they might have a TV going to be able to watch your uh, discussion. <clears throat> so just keep letting you know your discussion is going out further than the group you see on your screen. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Um, so we're going to begin in Revelation 14 uh, this morning, and we're going to review. I'm going to ask one of our uh, Zoom members here to uh, go ahead and read this for us. So uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, and the title or the focus of our a discussion this morning, uh, I was thinking about this morning, we're going to be discussing the March of the 144,000. I just made that up, of course, the March of the 144,000, but that's how I think of it in my mind. Um, so uh, who's uh, feeling good about reading this morning that could read uh, nice and clear verse 1 through verse 4 for us? Revelation 14. Verse 1 through 4. I can read it. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. All right, thank you. All right, so typically we're looking at these verses, and we, we like the next verses, starting in verse 6. We talk about those a lot, that being the three angels' messages. Those are also great, uh, but we sometimes tend to avoid uh, the top of the chapter because you know, we may have felt a little intimidated about this having to be one of the 144,000 because we thought about it in terms of having to get good enough or to prove our loyalty enough uh, that we can finally qualify. Um, but I want you to uh, consider a different angle on these verses here this morning, and that is more of an invitation. <clears throat> that this is an invitation that has been sent out. Um, you remember our parable that Jesus gave about the wedding garment, and he sent out uh, the invitations. Um, they were first, the friends were invited, they didn't want to come, and then, then after that, he sent it out to everywhere, the highways and the byways, everybody was invited. That's the gospel intent, that all are invited. <clears throat> and the invitation was to put on this robe, uh, to wear the wedding garment that had been provided freely by the king in the parable, you remember? Um, so this wasn't a thing that the people had to uh, achieve uh, some level of importance or value or even righteousness. Uh, it was provided for them. And what I mean by that is not that, um, that it was provided and they had no interaction to it. They did have to put it on, and we need to see that that put on the robe as allowing God to work inside of us, inside of you, to transform from the inside out. God is not really in the, the business of, of putting on something to make us look like something we're not. He's trying to transform from the inside out. But here in 
Revelation 14, this is being described in just different lingo. Using symbolic terms, we see there that it's the Father's name written on the forehead. That's the character of God uh, being known and understood and being taken into the heart and the mind. Um, many waters lets us know that there are many, uh, this, this last day message, this work of the 144,000 is going to come from many voices. <clears throat> And it's going to be heard across the earth uh, in the same effect that loud thunder does. You remember Jesus riding in on the donkey and, and then he, he wept. And it uh, basically caused the whole crowd to sort of stop and even become uh, overwhelmed with sadness that they didn't quite understand. When God speaks in his temple or on the earth, it can cause everything to kind of go quiet and hush. So... <clears throat> Uh, talking again about this group that's going to deliver this uh, knowledge of the Father like uh, many waters and loud thunder. It says they, they were singing a new song, as it were, uh, in front of the Lamb and the throne before the four living creatures. And, and there's something special about this song because this song apparently can't be learned by, <clears throat> by others. <clears throat> and so what it's referring to is an experience an experience in the knowledge of God and an experience in working, cooperating with God and being transformed by God, but while still living on the earth. So surrounded by sin, amongst sin, around those who are rejecting God, and yet they themselves uh, are being fully transformed for the purpose of being able to reveal the power of God on the earth before this earth's history closes. So the no one could learn this song is not <clears throat> about you needing to have a, you know, a special decoder ring to be able to get into this choir, but it is about understanding the truth about God, because next it's going to talk about how this group is not defiled by women or not defiled by false theologies, false teachings, false ideas. Where did they get this uh, clear and pure um, uh, understanding of the gospel it will have had to be from Jesus and Jesus alone from God and from God alone not from man's making or man's interpretations they're virgins uh, which means they have been made pure um, they're the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes so they're paying close attention to what Jesus says and what he does which starts not from sort of imagining into existence what he's doing now although we can look at that, but it must start with what he did while he was here. Uh, the way he treated people, the things that he said, the things that he taught, knowing those intimately, that's the beginning of following the lamb wherever he goes. These, the 144,000, they are redeemed from among men like first fruits. That means the evidence that the crop, so there's a larger crop somewhere, the, first, the 144 is just a small piece of that crop. But the evidence of their full growth, they're like in a harvest that the wheat is ready. There's a, there's a little bit of it that, that kind of shows, hey, it's ready and we pick it. The farmer picks it to see, hey, how is this whole field going to be like when the harvest is full grown? So that's the idea of first fruits. Um, and it's talking about how there's no deceit in their mouth. Uh, they're no longer misrepresenting God. So wanted to just read down that real quick um, and going to just open it up here for anybody to pitch in thoughts, questions, ideas, just on those verses alone. And then we're going to look elsewhere in scripture and some uh, quotes from Sister White here to help us kind of fill out what this looks like. Anybody got some thoughts right off the bat? <clears throat> Good news about the 144,000 that you can be part of. I guess in one way, right, as a musician, you know, there's skill involved to um, to execute or to perform. And it's not just knowledge, but it's practical uh, wisdom in, in how to play your voice or your instrument or, or whatever it is. You know, I think that's, it goes without saying, but, you know, there's years of training, there's years of discipline sometimes needed to, um, to 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 polish or sing a song well or play a song 
<clears throat> okay. And uh, what's cool about, about this, because <clears throat> I don't want anybody to, to say, oh man, we're going to have to have years now to get ready. Um, and the more years that you have spent studying the character of God, the better. Uh, but then I read some stuff that said, <clears throat> in the end, some will learn in mere days what took others years to understand. Uh, also, we have the story with uh, the Israelites who came across <clears throat> the Red Sea. And then God told them, I want you to build me a, a temple. and I want you to use gold and silver. And I want you to make these curtains and, and with tassels and with embroidery stuff they had never done. Stuff that... Um, uh, they had not had experience because they were brick makers, remember, in, in Egypt. Uh, but in the story, it says the Holy Spirit came upon them, and, and they were almost as if instantly made experts in gold and silver. Now, <clears throat> we, we'll have to connect now and relate uh, the parable about the workers in the field. So <clears throat> we can see from the story of Israel <clears throat> with their sort of instant expertise, <clears throat> there are last minute workers that come in the field and then there are the workers that worked all day through the heat of the day and it's kind of interesting in that parable it, it paints it almost as if it was a, a bummer to have to be one of the early workers or at least that was their attitude in the parable but think of it as uh, a little different about being able to spend uh, the whole of the day in the field with Jesus learning growing doing um, it really should have been <clears throat> thought of more as a, 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 a pleasure or a, well, what I want to say, a, 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 an opportunity to be there longer in the field, not come in last minute. So I, I want to give you both pieces. This thing about the 144,000, uh, it should not be with fear and trepidation that you have to spend years getting ready. But if you have years, by all means, use all of them to get ready. But the Lord is wanting to move with the power of the Holy Spirit as he did in the book of Acts. <clears throat> when? Um, next month, next year, five years from now, or today? We got a hand up maybe there. Kalal, you got your hand raised up, looks like. Jump in here. Maybe he had his hand raised. <clears throat> Okay, any other thoughts just on uh, verse 1 through 5 here as we're looking at just to get things started. If you look at that, though, the part that should be a little intimidating, I think rightfully so, is how do you feel, what do you think about so far as a people, and I'm talking about just believers in Jesus, how, how do we look uh, condition-wise as far as doing that or accomplishing that today. <clears throat> Should that give us a little bit of, uh, as uh, Wendell was saying, we need to understand this is going to take a little bit of preparation. Are we prepared? Is it happening? Are we in motion? Uh, do we see it happening on the earth right now, like voice of many waters with loud thunder? You know, I was thinking of this this morning, actually, uh, the 144,000, I was, I was thinking how, how must have the disciples felt, you know, there was a day that came, it was called the crucifixion, and they had no idea it was coming, even though he told them, and they wake up the next day, and they're in it. So there was lots of preparation that happened before. But I would have to say, I'm agreeing with you in the sense of there were 10 virgins. And all of them were actually sleeping. Even those disciples that were with Jesus were in some respect sleeping. And Jesus brought about events in such a way as to take them to the next level. And it was not that they were in any great preparation compared to everyone else. It was merely that they were looking to Jesus and ready to follow him wherever he went. Even though they ran away, when it, when it came back around, they really did follow him. And the preparation wasn't that they were with him longer. There was other people that followed him as well. I mean, there was 3,000 that followed very soon afterwards. So it's just interesting that even as Wendell was saying, you know, it takes practice. And yet 
when the rubber meets the road, I, I really feel like even those of the 144,000 at this current moment likely are going to fit the mold of sleeping to some respect. Not that they won't hang on to the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, that's that's good because, uh, in fact, a little bit more of the connection that you're bringing up there about the apostles, the, they had no idea they were being prepared, actually. Uh, but we can look backwards on their story and we can watch how for three and a half years, Jesus was working on preparing them for that crucifixion. And it's a little kind of strange to think about the fact that as much preparation as he gave them, they still weren't ready to be complete successors in the story. They all ran away. Of course, Jesus knew they would. Yeah. told them that. We know all that part. But, but nonetheless, Pentecost was coming. And this is kind of where we want to focus on this morning. Pentecost was coming. Jesus knew that. And he was working and prepping them for that. And the cross and their running away uh, was actually part of that preparation. Uh, I want to turn real quick to John, if you can put up on the screen for us, Acts of the Apostles. Uh, we got a little quote here we wanted to look at from Acts of the Apostles. And if you got your book, those of you that can look it up, uh, we're working on page 36. And this is a description, since Charlie brought us up right to here, a description of the disciples. So this is after the cross, after they were afraid, ran away, after they met with Jesus on the beach, after the ascension of Christ. Now there's 10 days between uh, when Christ ascended and when uh, Pentecost, uh, sort of the tongues of fire on their heads part began. And we're just going to read this one paragraph to pick up kind of what was going on with the disciples. And this is what needs to be um, central, I think, in our uh, thoughts and questions about the 144,000, about being one of the 144,000 or, or being prepared to be. And it's right here next to Apostles. And here's what it says. As the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they numbered, oh, hold on just a second, uh, sorry, as the okay, disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they numbered their hearts in true, repent, humbled their hearts in true repentance and confession. Sorry, my screen letters are a little small. <laughs> confession of their unbelief. As they called to remembrance the words that Christ had spoken to them before his death, they understood more fully their meaning. Truths which had passed from their memory were again brought into their minds, and they repeated them to one another. They reproached themselves, that's interesting, uh, for their misapprehension uh, or their slowness to understand of the Savior. Like a procession, scene after scene of his wonderful life, that's a good thing to focus on there, of his wonderful life passed before them. As they meditated upon his pure and holy life, they felt that no toil would be too hard, no sacrifice too great. If only they could bear witness in their lives to the loveliness of Christ's character. Oh, if they could but have the past three years to live over again, they thought how differently they would have acted. If they could only see the master again, how earnestly they would strive to show him how deeply they loved him and how sincerely they sorrowed for having ever grieved him by a word or by an act of unbelief. But they were comforted. This is what we've got to uh, see as an exciting piece here. But they were comforted by the thought that they were forgiven. And they determined that so far as possible, they would atone for their unbelief by bravely confessing him before the world. <clears throat> So this, this was what they were going through after the crisis, but now comes the, the need to represent him correctly on the earth. They were, as Charlie wanted us to connect with, faulty men and women, um, had made many mistakes, had been slow to comprehend and understand, even though they got to spend three and a half years almost nonstop with the master himself. But now comes the big change, and this is describing the focus of the big change and what started to change in them and in their lives. 
So you can read in Acts of the Apostles there if you, you wish later the whole chapter. It's really going to kind of connect and focus on how we um, can know and see um, this change going on that they went from these sort of selfish, wanting to be first kind of uh, uh, disciples to uh, now being wanting nothing, nothing else, nothing more than to represent their master and savior correctly. All right, anybody got some thoughts or questions to add to that? Don't wait long enough for you to unmute your microphone and jump in. Go ahead. Charlie, is that kind of what you were you want us to focus on there? Yeah, that was. I had no idea you were going there, so thank you. Oh no, I'm just I was following Perfect. you. I just had it on the list. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so we we'll want you to see one. This as an invitation. It's kind of like we should see it as Je uh, Revelation fourteen. We should see it as Jesus saying, "Come, follow me," because uh, it says right, "They follow the Lamb wherever He goes." So He's asking us to come, follow Him, to let the things of the world become less and less important, especially realizing the need of the people around us and the crisis. Uh, last weekend, we had kind of talked about that crisis and what it was like to be in the middle of the crisis. I um, want to hey, just Bobby. read one. We don't have to put this one on the screen, but oh, we got a hand up? John, got a hand up? Uh, uh, sorry, Kalal has a hand there. Yeah, yeah, I keep seeing Kalal's hand. Go ahead, Kalal, uh, jump in here. Not sure if he's waving hello or. I think it's an internet delay. It's just paused there. Yeah, probably. Just pause there. Okay. Uh, thinking of what it would be like to be in, uh, as we were relating last week, and to sort of the crisis going on, um, uh, people around us afraid and panicking, um, whether it be a, a real uh, danger or a false danger or whatever it is. Um, there's one in a chapter that I had given you guys to read about the unseen watcher. And I thought this one is just kind of helpful for us to imagine uh, what these 144,000 are going to be like in the middle of the calamity that will be going all around them, i.e. the time of trouble. And so it's describing Daniel in this one, in that chapter, the unseen watcher uh, from prophets and kings. And it's describing Daniel... Um, you know, the, the party was going on with Belteshazzar. They had brought in the, uh, the temple from, from Jerusalem temple cups so they could drink out of them. Uh, they had no sense of danger from what they was the enemy surrounding outside that was going to overtake them. They thought they were secure, uh, stay with the ship sort of thinking, um, no problems whatsoever. And then here comes this uh, announcement that the enemy had come through the gates and this hand on the wall. Uh, that had written in, in sort of fiery letters. So in the middle of all of that activity, um, here's they bring Daniel in. Uh, finally, they thought, uh, I think it was uh, Belteshazzar's uh, mother or grandmother that uh, said, hey, we should ask Daniel. He used to interpret dreams and whatnot for kings before. Uh, so they bring him in, and it just gives this description about Daniel in the middle of the chaos and everybody there. It says this, before that terror-stricken throng, so he's in the, wherever they're having this party now in the town, in the, uh, in the palace, uh, and it describes uh, this, before the terror-stricken throng, Daniel, unmoved by the promises of the king, because the king had lavished all these promises of gifts, if he could just interpret the handwriting on the wall, so it says, Daniel's unmoved by the promises of the king. He stood in, the, in quiet dignity. This is what's cool. Quiet dignity. Uh, the same, the dignity of a servant to the most high. Not to speak words of flattery to the king, but to interpret the message of doom. Thy gifts be to thyself, he said, and give your reward to another. Yet I will read 
the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. So it was just another example of when we know what's happening, what's really going on and what's important, uh, we don't have to participate in the panic or the chaos that will come in a much bigger way when we get to the real time of trouble. But this calm uh, dignity of the servant of the Most High is partly what's going to be the experience of the 144,000. Okay, anybody, I'm still waiting for somebody to jump in with some thoughts here on it before we move on. Yeah, I have. Reference again. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, Revelation chapter 14, verse uh, 1, um, as uh, Sir uh, said about the uh, Jesus is inviting us to follow, so the Acts of the Apostle, page uh, 591 says, but all who follow the Lamb in heaven must first have followed him on earth, not fretfully or capriciously, but in trustful loving, willing obedience as the flock follows the shepherd. That's a good one. Thank you, Kalal. Uh, exactly on point. Uh, the connection that paragraph is making there is that uh, sometimes we maybe get lost trying to figure out what he's doing in heaven, like following him around uh, as he's moving through the temple or the sanctuary or different ideas and thoughts. But most importantly is to follow him now in real life. Uh, not, there was a couple of words you might have to help me, Kalal. Not capriciously. Was the other word fretfully? Yeah, so not fretfully as in thrashing about and in panic or, or just having to uh, jump because of the new emergency, but also not capriciously, capriciously, right? Like holier than thou looking down on others or some, something that it's an experience that only I can have because I spend so many hours in my study or what, what, however we think of, uh, of that, right? So not that way, but, but more like the disciples who they actually went out on the hillsides with Jesus. They went from house to house. They went out and they watched and observed how he, Jesus, how he worked with the people, how he spent time with the people, and he cared about the people. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, everybody come to our meeting because we're going to stand up with all knowledge, uh, but it was actually out there helping them in real real ways, uh, especially spiritually, right? So that's a good one. Thank you, Kalal. Did you have more thoughts you wanted to add for us, Kalal? So let's take a look at a verse. If no one else is jumping in, just let me know, John, if somebody's wanting to jump in. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. Let's take a look at Hosea, uh, verse six, uh, chapter six, verse three. Hosea six, verse three. This is part of that invitation, like Jesus saying, "Come follow me," or the invitation for the 144,000. Um, and and I, want, I want this to be uh, maybe connected to the one Kalal just brought up about uh, not, uh, and I already forgot the word, fretfully or, or thrashing around idea. Look at this verse. Uh, let us know, verse three, let us know, let us pursue knowledge of the Lord. Uh, so there's, there's the, the key thing. It's not about pursuing political knowledge or what's going on on the planet knowledge or um, you know, sometimes we think the signs of the times have to do with what's in the news. But really the signs of the times have to do with let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. Um, but I want to key in on this going forth like the morning. Uh, 
many of you have, have um, doubtfully gone out early in the morning. Uh, some do it really early, like John. I know he gets up really early. Uh, but you get to watch and see the sun come up. And what you should note about that is it comes steadily on pace. It's not hurried, nor is it slowed. Um, <clears throat> it is inevitable that it's going to come, uh, this sunrise, the rising of the sun. If you sit out on the back porch or front porch, whichever faces the right direction, early in the morning, before there's any extra light at all and it's dark, you might even notice uh, when suddenly there seems to be, wow, it's a little bit brighter than it was 10 minutes ago, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And you know the sun is coming even though you don't see it yet, even though there's no reflective bright light coming off of any other objects that the sun may hit yet. Uh, you don't see the sun directly yet, but you know it's coming how? Because the sky itself is lighting up a little more and a little more. This is... This verse is talking about the second coming um, and everything that comes with it, time of trouble and all the rest of that. It's coming slow and steady. You can see the signs well before. But imagine the guy who sleeps until, uh, I don't know, say 10 o'clock. Uh, when he wakes up, boom, it's just suddenly full day, right? It's happening like full on. He didn't get to see the slow progression. So part of the following the Lamb wherever he goes in spiritual terms is about with things around us, but most importantly on the spiritual things around us, seeing it, seeing the evidences of it coming, of, of what's happening. And those are mostly related to where is and what's going on with the, the, the setting up of the 144,000. Wars and rumors of wars, we've had those always. Uh, calamities and, and dilemmas around us, whether it be uh, like plagues or like uh, uh, hurricanes and, uh, and floods, those, it says right in the scripture, when Jesus points at those, he says, those things you'll always have. The, don't be afraid when those things happen, they're happening. Uh, that's not at the end. That's only uh, signs of the beginning. Uh, so you can expect those always. But, but the work of th what happened to the apostles at, at the day of Pentecost and their change in their life and their going out with only one focus and that was to try to help others know the truth. That, where is that happening in our communities, in our lives, in, in our own homes and so on? That's, that's the important one. So it's gonna, it really should uh, bring us when we read this stuff around to our next one here. I'm gonna go to Daniel. Uh, Daniel again, and if you uh, spend time later really reading these verses, we're only going to look at a couple of the verses to make the point this morning, but uh, later today, if you can read the whole of, of at least verse 3 through 19 of Daniel 9, you're going to pick up uh, kind of a flavor of something here. Um, the verses we're going to read together, uh, we'll, we'll start on verse 4 and read just a couple of verses here, four and five. <clears throat> and, and so think about this in terms of Daniel. He had uh, been a servant of God uh, most of his life, the whole story of the book of Daniel that we know of from when he was captured. He had been faithful to God. He had interpreted dreams to the kings for God. He had um, even had to deliver uh, you know, bad news like the King Belteshazzar. But, but in his experience, in the scriptures, we don't see record of his uh, mistakes, of his sins, uh, like we do Abraham. We at least know uh, Abraham had some troubles and everybody else, uh, most of them on the list, but Daniel not. But notice what Daniel does here in chapter 9. O Lord, he says, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant. So he doesn't say, we the people who keep our covenant. God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Verse 5, we, uh, notice he doesn't say they, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts. A precept is a, a teaching, an idea, or a truth, right? We have departed from your precepts and your judgments. 
Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets that you sent, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and to all the people of the Lord. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you. You are righteous, but to us, shame of face. And so here we ought to just pick up the bad news part of the story of that, yes, we have not not done this work on the earth yet. This has not been accomplished. We have been distracted on uh, many other things, including false ideas of righteousness by faith and salvation. Um, the reason that's important is because of our the promise we get where God says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, and that's what Daniel's doing here. It's quite an amazing concept that Daniel, the one who uh, that we know of wasn't sinning against the Lord. He was being faithful, but he includes himself because of all he has to do is look around and say, where are the people of God? And in his day, uh, they were in houses and maybe some in palaces in a heathen country because they had been conquered by Babylon. Um, they had been taken over and, and they had been wiped out. And they had been idolatrous before, which is why they uh, now were taken by Babylon. But again, Daniel looks around and he sees the condition of his people, of his uh, nation, uh, the people called by God to represent him correctly on the earth, and the condition wasn't good. Uh, and we can, you, you can spend time in your own prayer connecting the details of how we're doing that today. I won't go there. I'll let you work on that with God. But but the good news is, as you read through the rest of Daniel 9, watch how Daniel keeps grabbing onto the promise. And in this chapter, what he's working on is God had promised that after 70 years, he would uh, free his people and bring them back and rebuild the temple again. So part of this prayer was Daniel grabbing onto the great hope that it is time now uh, it has been time for a while, but especially time now for the 144,000 activity. And again, I'm not talking about a quantity of people. I'm not talking about a, a list of names that we may know or don't know. I'm talking about a description of a people who follow the Lamb wherever he goes and, and really are the hand of God at work on the earth to bring about lighting up of the whole earth with uh, the character and knowledge and the righteousness of Christ. Okay, I'm going to pause again, hoping somebody will jump in here with some questions, thoughts, something to add, another yeah, paragraph yeah. or verse. Go ahead. So as uh, somebody who cannot claim to be any greater than the disciples who were caught really completely unaware, even though they've been warned, <laughs> it's really hard to imagine or even picture us in an emotive activity that would constitute what we saw at the Pentecost until the test comes. I don't know how to say it. It's like Daniel was uh, praying for the people at that point. But that, he was definitely among the minority, maybe the only one. It's, it's a precious few that will actually take up the torch and go with the good news about God and start sharing it until persecution or some other thing comes. I guess I don't know how to, how do you, it's, it's not possible to shake yourself out of your own boots and wake your own self up. <laughs> it's not possible. Well, and I think Charlie, the point where I wanted to go with this is that we kind of have been trained to panic about, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to just use the phrase time trouble or the crisis. Uh, kind of like the disciples imagine in their story instead of the way it went if every day uh, or every other day they had worked on the subject mostly of how to deal with the persecution or how to deal with a Rome or yeah. how to deal with uh, getting crucified uh, they actually their attention was not brought on to that by Christ what it was brought on to was knowing him yeah. and at first the best they could do was help some crippled person come to Jesus. They didn't know how to teach. They didn't know how to preach. They didn't even do miracles at first. Um, but they, they, they 
followed him wherever he went. That was the first thing, right? He said, come follow me. And then they just started doing it. Then they started helping people come and inviting more to come. And they learned simultaneously while they were helping people come. And then, then afterwards, well, I'm going to jump to the end now. This is where this is going. I'm going to read from Great Controversy. This is talking about uh, just prior to the um, time of trouble, so-called, uh, that we put that phrase on. Great Controversy, uh, page 612, paragraph 1. And this is how it describes what this, I uh, keep referring to him as the 144, will be doing on the earth. Servants of God... It says, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration. That, that's enough to think about right there. Just, wow, that's like Moses coming down off the mountain, right? Face lit up. Mm -hmm. uh, so faces lighted up, shining with holy consecration. will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. Now we need to dig into what is that message, but, but it's just going to go on here. By thousands of voices, there's our many waters. All over the earth, the warning will be given. Warning of what? Uh, that's second, third angel's message. The warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. And signs and wonders will follow the believers. Um, that's, that's an exciting description. Anybody want to sign up to be part of that? So, Charlie, I yes. think go ahead with your thoughts. I think that... Um, yeah, this isn't about focusing on persecution or even time of trouble so much as getting a knowledge of God first and then helping others come to know it. That should be, that's what the focus was for the disciples. Bobby, uh, Wendell has a, a Okay, go ahead, Wendell. Hey, so um, God is love, right? And the knowledge yeah. of love um, is expansive, but... Um, I will tell you, uh, friends, and maybe some here not from yesterday, that um, I don't have a SDA tradition, and I'm not a member. Um, but as I've gone forward in with the knowledge of love and understanding how the gospel works, I've had the most incredible conversations with people who um, would never set a foot in church, and they cannot understand a God who could not prevent the Holocaust or a God who inflicted a flood, a worldwide flood to kill everything except uh, humans, except eight. And one such um, person is an uncle of mine, a dear uncle, who is a retired nuclear physicist from MIT. He's a Marxist. He's an atheist. But we've had the deepest gospel uh, conversations about how love works. And so anyways, to, to, to the point of being ready, to the point of uh, being persecuted, um, if we were to uh, explain how things work and how, how love works and start replacing some words, some religious words and verbiage, instead of use the word sin, how would you functionally describe sin? Would it not be some type of selfishness, self-centeredness, me before you? whatever, you know, survival of the fittest, any of that, right? You're going to find that people are ready and open to discuss things. And let me just drop a bomb here to give you an example of this, right? As Christians, you know, we would all line up pretty much in the pro-life uh, uh, section of, of, uh, of voting. However, um, to have legislative action to punish people for their choice is I don't believe how love works. So in one way, I can say that I am pro-choice and pro-life at the same time. I'm against abortion and I will do everything in my power to, to, to help people through that situation, short of forcing them to not have an abortion because the state says there's some legality will punish you because uh, you're breaking a law. But the law that is being broken is the law of life, if you want to look at it that way. So anyways, these types of unpacking of things um, help the gospel spread the good news of what love is. I rest my case. <laughs> good. Thank you, Wendell, because that is what the work of the 
we keep referring to them as 144,000 just for the sake of this morning's discussion. Um, the real work is to help people understand what God is like. For instance, what you just said, we know of Jesus that he was pro-life. Uh, Old Testament said that uh, I desire that none should die, but that all should come to repentance and have life. Simultaneously, he was pro-choice because he didn't force any of his disciples to have to follow him. They were invited. So that concept is not, not just a good idea. It's actually biblically sound based on Jesus, right? We look at Jesus to actually learn that and get that. And, and so, so many of the things around us in life, many, many questions. Uh, a few of them were even brought up in what you said about, you know, uh, the God who would wipe out all but eight or that would allow the Holocaust to happen. There, there, there is a good way to understand how God, um, his interaction with the earth through all of those things has been loving, has been full of grace, has been full of mercy, truth, and even justice. Um, but those confusions and those questions on the earth are the source of all the great trouble in the earth. Um, and so really we're not talking about this group uh, proclaiming a some sort of denominational loyalty message. This is about revealing a tr true knowledge of God whether we call that the gospel or whether we call that uh, the good news about who Jesus is. But the focus must be on helping others understand God correctly or rightly, right? And not just throwing verses around uh, without really understanding what we're meaning. So definitely that has to be the focus of this whole, um, as I called it at the beginning, the march of the 144,000. All right, somebody else, thoughts brewing here, questions or thoughts? I was kind of still thinking about that thing that you just got about um, from verse 6, 12.1, where it says, Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. And I know that it's talking about physical of all, and the signs and wonder signs and um and things to be wondered at are the transformed lives of his followers that is the greatest miracle and the greatest sign that could ever be shown correct that'll give the greatest I, evidence that god is real this is describing the work that those people will be doing but they won't be doing it without the transformed life in themselves first right because otherwise uh, it gives a confusing message to have sinful, selfish people still running around uh, and connecting all that. But they must come together, transformed life, uh, it, and then and then says, God sends them out like the disciples to do that. It says, with their faces lighted up and mm -hmm. shining with holy consecration. So their faces are, I mean, it might be that there's actually physically shining happening. but the holy consecration is they just by even looking into the face of these people, they have been so transformed that everything is, that comes out of them, you can actually feel the presence of God when they're near. Not like a magical thing. You just literally, you can feel the love just coming from them towards you. Like I think in the same, in a sim, similar, and I suppose the same way that it was with Jesus on earth. People were just drawn to him by his love. Yeah, good. That face lit up thing. <clears throat> um, it, it describes in Desire of Ages how Jesus, when the people looked at him, they could just tell right away there's something different. Uh, so it begins with that. And then how far he chooses to light it up. Remember Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah. So it, it can be anywhere from just the love that one sees in these people's faces all the way to glowing so bright they might run away. <laughs> I guess important. partly why I'm thinking about this is I was at a um, at a memorial service a while ago, and a, a really young person had died, and it was really tragic, and we were very sad about it. 
And um, anyway, just after we uh, were headed home, I was talking with uh, the pastor and it was like, you know, he said, I would just love to see us be a sign to the people by having relationships and marriages that never fail. Like, wouldn't that be a sign to the world if there was no divorce at all in our church? Not because we just forced ourselves to stay together, but because there was that much love among God's people. Even that small thing, seemingly small, could be a sign that could go so far. That's and my instant one, tendency was to say, to say, you know, but I'm wanting, I would love to see the real sign, you know, like the miraculous signs. And I had to take a while to realize that, you know, I think he's right, that a sign, the sign of a truly transformed life and evidence of it in all the people around our relationships. And we can't, it's, we're not responsible for anybody else other than ourselves, but at least in how we treat our spouse, for those who know God, that, you know, like Jesus said, though somebody should raise from the dead, I will not believe him. So it's the small uh, winning influence and the love that if they will not believe that, there's no great wonder or sign that's going to change the mind. These are the greatest signs that can be given. Correct. And these miraculous signs are only a, only a final piece of the puzzle to give evidence for those that were possibly on the edge or to give those who were never going to make the choice no excuse that they might see that even though I saw miraculous signs, I still was not willing to believe. Well, we should keep it in context, though, of, of Jesus. For instance, um, he didn't do miracles just on the last few days before the crucifixion. He did it all the way through. However, he did have what yeah. you're describing about some who came and all they were looking for was to see some proof. To them, he said, no, no sign will be given except the sign of the Son of Man or the Son of Jonah. Or, or, or uh, of Jonah. So, so he, he, he knew how to correctly, if you want to call it, dispense yeah. or to withhold. But the miracles were actually a part, meaning the physical miracles you're talking about, like healings, they were actually a part of um, how the gospel got taught, how it got preached. It was to show the people that God desired to relieve their suffering, to uh, heal them, not only physically, but then where you're pointing to is the spiritual healing, which, you know, again, if Jesus were running around and just joining all the carousing and, and sin partying, whatever, and then running and doing miracles at the same time, all we get is a confusing message. So what we saw was a representation in the disciples later of what believing in Jesus looked like, what faith in Jesus looked like, what salvation was supposed to do in them, even though we couldn't say they were as perfect as Jesus, but we saw a lot of change, and then connected with that were, were these miracles. So uh, not to discount yeah, that's, at that's all good. that the greatest miracle is the changed life. That's what the people need to see. Um, but along with it, as it says here, will come all of it, including the, the physical miracles and so on. Um, for those of you that, that haven't uh, recently but want to uh, dig further into just the whole idea of Christ and his disciples and miracles and whatnot, great chapter in Desire of Ages uh, called Go Teach All Nations. It deals with both the gospel being presented as that's the main work of his disciples you know, really this 144,000 term where I'm headed is to help you understand that that just equals disciple. Uh, disciple, 144,000, it's the same thing. Um, and those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes, as the disciples, they'll be doing this work, which will include uh, the preaching of the clear gospel, as well as all the power of the Holy Spirit that attends, that is supposed to attend. And in that chapter, it'll point out how God's been wanting to do even these physical miracles uh, for a long time now, but has not been because, again, where are his disciples? Uh, and as long as uh, uh, they are just so distracted with uh, other things, things of the world, love of the world, uh, sin itself, um, then uh, we're not in any condition to be 
used the way the disciples were. So the, the good news part is that the focus of the message is about the love of God, character of God. And, and somehow it's going to move from us being, um, I guess, maybe just not out moving, not out doing, not yet sharing, uh, like the disciples maybe at the beginning, to what we see afterwards in, in the book of Acts. So that, that's really kind of the summary of what we're doing with that first part of, of Revelation 14. Hey, Bobby. Yeah, go ahead, um, John. Uh, Kelvin, uh, I believe, has a comment. Oh, good. Jump in, nope. Kelvin. No, <laughs> sorry, I, I thought you were uh, wanting to say something. I just, you know, kind of thinking and responding, uh, perhaps with my shaking head and flying hands, um, to what some of the things are being said. The, the, the people that God comes back, I think, for, for the people on the earth when, when he returns uh, will be people who have been fully transformed i'm convinced of that and what that looks like i don't think we've seen yet and i don't know what's holding us back and i i don't know what it would take whatever it is let's do it so i love that question calvin because that's actually what sparked us working on this was two weeks ago, I think it was, Amber and I were discussing the same thing and she said, uh, yeah, I don't know what it would take or what would, maybe she asked it a different way. Maybe she asked, what will it take? <laughs> and so reviewing this material is partly to put in front of us what's, what's needed, what's possible, what's potential. Um, I'm not sure that I can easily answer this, the question about what will it take, uh, but for me, it's helpful to keep reviewing what what God is after. What is God trying to do? What is he inviting us into so that we can um, surrender, uh, would be a good word to use right here probably, to surrender for him to more deeply and more fully accomplish the work that he's wanting to do in us. So there's nothing about this discussion that I would like to turn to a righteousness by works discussion in any way, <laughs> but, but to have our foundation of righteousness by faith and the work of God by his power fully uh, begin to manifest itself. And I think, again, what's going on around us with uh, the current um, health dilemma, uh, health crisis, kind of just underscores what it could look like if, if, and when, not, not ever, I'm not saying if as in never, but if and when, uh, this, this preparation is completed enough that God can send it into motion, right? Set it in motion. Um, I, I didn't look it up this morning. I was going to, and, and I didn't get time to, but there's a description that describes the 144,000 in Sister White's writings, and she describes them almost like an army, and it kind of mimics what's in uh, the Old Testament about the army of locusts, and she, she talks about uh, how they march shoulder to shoulder, uh, in step, in perfect uh, accord, and when if one falls, meaning like in battle, if one falls, another one immediately steps in and takes their place, and it gives this sort of like this marching steady pace across the earth, and when you picture it not as an army physically killing people, <clears throat> but as an army that is fighting back the false ideas about God, the false uh, teachings or giving the truth, and they're steady and they're in unity and perfect accord. Well, we're really reading the description about the disciples where it says they met together daily and they put away all differences, right? And they searched in the scriptures and they ran from house to house. Um, that's exactly in other words how it describes the 144,000 and their work in the end. Um, I also probably want to toss in here, uh, just because of that discussion that we started on with Amber, that this isn't something that you're really supposed to keep reading to then look and go, well, when I see them, maybe I can join them. <laughs> uh, when I see that large group, maybe I can jump in. Uh, no, uh, it might be more like Elijah's story, uh, meaning he didn't know there was anybody else. Uh, he couldn't find anybody else. The Lord had to reassure him there were others, but Elijah didn't know where they were, uh, didn't see him doing anything. You know, if he had said, well, well, if there's others, Lord, let them go to Mount Carmel. I'd like to stay home instead. Well, 
that's not how the story went, right? So Elijah all alone is what I want to underscore here. Uh, Elijah all alone was talking to God, pleading with God. This is our Daniel 9 pleading with God about the condition of things. And in Daniel 9, it's mostly about in the church, not, not, not the country, uh, not the politics. It's mostly about the condition of God's people. But Elijah was in that prayer in Daniel 9, um, asking the Lord to do something, to, to move on the earth, to accomplish turning the people back to him. And so God says, okay, I got an idea. How about you go see the king and tell him no more rain? <laughs> you know, I, I get to that part of the story. And if I, I put myself in Elijah's shoes, I'd be saying, I know that's not a good plan because then the king's going to be mad and I'm going to get in trouble. He's going to want to arrest me and kill me. So why don't we come up with a different plan? <laughs> but no, Elijah was asking the Lord for the plan. And he followed pretty faithfully step by step on the plan. Um, and here we're just looking at it with different, Symbolic terminology, meaning the 144,000 following the Lamb. All of these symbols and wording are supposed to bring all these stories together to give you encouragement that the Lord wants you today. Uh, Amber, one of the questions she asked is, when, when is this supposed to begin? And the answer is, well, it was already. So for us as an individual, for you as an individual to know that the Lord wants to light you up first with a knowledge about him. Uh, knowing him and what little bit you know. Don't don't let the devil trick you with this idea you don't know enough. Uh, just take what little you know that you know for sure matches Jesus and tell somebody that. And I don't mean, this isn't the strategy to beat people's doors down and make them listen. This is about those who are hurting, questioning, suffering around you, and they ask any question at all that might relate to knowing Jesus then fill their cup with what you got. And what will happen is that as you do, in simple ways, right? we're not talking about teaching all complicated symbols and doctrines, but simple things about Jesus, your cup will be fuller than it was before you started. Right, Tracy? <laughs> this is the part She's where Tracy, Tracy will jump in and tell us what that's like. <laughs> Uh, when Wendell has a comment. Go ahead, Wendell. You know, it's just to the point of um, what will it take. I just want to encourage everybody that there are so many opportunities in our neighborhoods and in our community um, to be influential and to get involved. I think for me, the most important thing has been to um, shed my institutional re religious mindset or paradigm. Um, I think that's the encumbrance. I think that's a, a problem. Now, and uh, let me just give you a quick example. If you have Netflix, and if you've watched the show called The Game Changers, everybody eats and everybody in America has some kind of um, concern about what they eat because of their health. So there is this, this show, The Game Changers, is, a, is an amazing documentary that talks about health laws. And so we already have an entree right there. It's done very well on Netflix. And, and uh, you know, uh, I've talked to all kinds of people from young people to, to a CEO here uh, of a major financial institution about the show. And they've come to me about it because they know just because I'm, I don't say it, but because when I'm around people, I eat a certain way and they go, hey, have you seen the show? And so now this is an entree into to health laws. But the idea is that there's laws of nature and the, the laws of how things work that are so symmetrical to this. It's an easy, it's an easy entree. So, you know, the, it, it, I'm just suggesting that this is something that's kind of common everyday, everyday thing. You don't have to be a, a scientist or a politician to be influential. And, uh, Okay, we also have a comment uh, from Ati. Go ahead, Ati. One second. Yeah, we can hear you. Mm 
Hmm. Maybe not. Oop. Not working. Uh, he did say one second. So <laughs> uh, when, he come, when he comes back, we'll let him let him jump yeah. in. Amber, uh, are you there? Can you jump in with any more thoughts that we were working on on this question about the uh, the final work here? Um. No. <laughs> no. Well, we didn't get the question answered yet, did we? Well, I don't think there's a necessarily specific answer. Well, you had asked the question, what will it take? When will this begin? Um, you got any more thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I don't know. I guess it's kind of an open-ended question because I don't expect a specific answer. But I, I love the words that you've said. And I, I guess I really love what I, I realize that this is not um, what we're dealing with right now is not um, the end time of what we're, you know, looking at. But it's interesting to see how people have, especially at the beginning, what I, what I could see and what I could, could notice was, um, well, I remember a long time ago, sorry, I keep jumping. Um, but a long time ago, Bobby, I asked you, I said, how, how in the world are, I, I just, I couldn't picture the, the sheep and the goats, how, how they would be separated. And, and the, that, that idea, that concept was just so foreign, like I just couldn't grasp it. And how, how, if God gave us um, all the knowledge and, and, you know, you read Revelation, you read Daniel and and you see that um, people are, even with all of the knowledge and seeing that they bow the knee and, and confess that he is God and then turn around and, and try to assail the city. And, and it just blew my mind, like how, how, could, how could you you'd be both? But what I've seen um, just in this little picture that we have with the current situation that we're in, um really surprised me that I you could see people on both sides where some people were just absolutely loving and giving and wanting to help and what can I do and then you have the other side of the spectrum uh where you have people that are just you you see the selfish acts that are happening um they're so scared that they just they pull everything inward their focus is very self oriented rather than neighbor oriented and it just it was a very vibrant picture in my head going well, there it is wow look at that so i guess there was my thought i don't know that that's what you were asking that was great i think uh i think Ati is uh available Ati's now. Back. can you guys hear me <laughs> yes all right hey bobby how you doing happy sabbath good <laughs> happy sabbath to you um yeah i don't know just going off of someone was mentioning about health and stuff uh, this is a question i have um and i know john has seen this on facebook but i've come across something that um was read in inspiration about during that time there'd be no ministerial work done but medical missionary work and i haven't totally like understood that what she said um do you have like and understanding of what that means or you mean how to relate the health message with the gospel and like this this current dilemma or whatever yeah um sure we can talk about that for a few minutes uh i can't say that i have all the expert knowledge on it and uh, my knowledge of sort of all the health uh best do's and don'ts are are, are not as much as i know about the character of god but i will say this um health like right now just just notice how if someone were fearful for their health and if you have what what simple knowledge you may have about how they can stay healthy in this crisis um it's very valuable to open doors but um, the gospel focus the work of the 144 the disciples in the end they'll understand that the health 
question, whether it be a miraculous healing or stop eating so much sugar, um, those are only things that open the door to the big thing. The big thing is never the health, never the food. The big thing is the knowledge of God, the character of God. So they, they can go together. But uh, for instance, we're used to in Sister White's writings hearing about the health message as the right arm of the gospel, right? Well, the right arm is typically the strong arm of somebody. So it kind of could represent strength or health, but it is the arm. It's not the head. A man can live without his arm. Uh, he can't live without his head. So in that context, health and helping people with health is a great door opener. And so we can relate to it as the arm. Uh, but the head of the gospel is Jesus and a knowledge of Jesus. And so we don't ever want to swap those two. But, you know, I, I relate to it a little bit like we had a neighbor once that um, they had their kids were very um, not disciplined. We'll just put it that way. And so um, <clears throat> Uh, my wife had an opportunity to interact with the neighbors uh, about kids and 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 uh, relating to kids or child development and training in in simple ways just that you know their kids wanted to play with our kids and then pretty soon uh, their kids in our house were learning to say uh, for from for our in our home they they were taught to say yes auntie that's kind of a Hawaiian thing maybe uh, but uh, they called Kimmy auntie. So they, if if she asked them to stop doing something, whatever they learned, they were learning because my kids were learning to say yes, mom. They would say yes, auntie. Well, the little kids went home, and they said yes, mom to their mom, and their mom come over right away and wanted to know what are you doing to my children in a good way, right? But they wanted to know what what are you, what's happening, and <clears throat> one thing led to another until pretty soon they were having a discussion about what those kids ate, and uh, I think the assignment was given. To the neighbor, could you just write down everything that they eat all day long? Let's just see what it is. Doesn't matter. Don't try to fix it. Don't change it. Just write it down. Well, then when they sat together and looked at it, they were looking at. Well, notice how almost everything on here is sugar, sugar. And then the kids are very, you know. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that discussion led to Bible studies. Uh, pretty soon we were having Bible studies with the neighbors, and they were learning about the character of God. That's the bigger deal. Because mom at home, even if she figures out how to feed them the right stuff, but she's still yelling at them and kicking them around and forcing them and, and, and you know, not relating properly, uh, that's going to be a bigger problem. So as Charlie said before, the heart change and the character of God is, is the biggest thing, the first thing, and the health opens the door it's a way to have discussions it can people can feel better, they can uh, have, have calmer. Uh, insides, not fevered, I think is a word used in Spirit of Prophecy about the fevered blood. All those things are valuable and important. So imagine uh, just from the scenario around us, the idea that things are going even worse than you see right now chaotically out there in the world and in politics across the globe, and people are dying. Um, and they hear... <clears throat> that there's a neighbor down the road there uh, somewhere in their town that uh, has laid hands on somebody and they got well from whatever virus they're dying from. And so they knock on your door and they say, listen, could you come and pray? What are you going to say? Um, that's not the time to have a, a seminar on food. That's the time to go over there and lay hands on them. And the Lord does his work. And then you're opened up to conversations about uh, many things could be uh, first and most important would be gospel but but health is still part of what jesus wasn't giving out was health both spiritual physical mental the mental health is another one we we don't often sort of delve in into and talk about but the mental health crisis uh is huge right people uh afraid um i was reading just recently how the the numbers you know of COVID deaths versus influenza deaths versus one of them on the list was suicide. And that list was, that was a number was so big. I had no idea it was that big. That's connected to the, the mental health and the mental health, uh, all, all the crises are going to be connected to fear and doubt and un, untruths and unbeliefs. And it can get so bad that pretty soon it takes more than just say a, a discussion about the gospel. There's real, crises that have to be fixed but all of these things i think we we, we kind of refer to them as health message 
but the gospel itself is health message. And so I would put all of that together, uh, AT, and, and, and just know that if you've got opportunities with the neighbors and the discussion begins on health, by all means, uh, go down that track, uh, help them with that. And then when they say, where are you getting all this knowledge? Don't say, well, I, I read lots of articles about it. Say, well, the Lord Jesus Christ taught me a few things. And, and if you don't know him, I'd love to help you know him. That's what we did with the neighbors when we, that's how we get, switched it to that. They, they, they wanted to know. And I said, well, we can't take credit for being smart, uh, but we can tell you about Jesus if you haven't met him. And they go, oh yeah, we'd like to meet him. I thought that was pretty cool. And so that ended up going into the Bible studies. But Ati, before I, I leave that, a, a, any more specifics you want to throw on the table about that or ask? Yeah, um, what I was wondering as you were speaking, um, is this is this a work that includes, let's say, like should the whole denomination move in this direction using the health message as, um, I didn't really use the word bait, but something to draw people in. Yeah, opening the door. Is that solely dependent on the individuals. Does that make sense? Well, sure. I think like friends is just watch Jesus. Jesus had some people come to him and the first connection was health, meaning they were healed of bleeding or they were healed of leprosy or they're healed of blindness. And not all of those uh, then turned to him for spiritual healing. Uh, again, from the Go Teach All Nations chapter in Desire of Ages, it says uh, Jesus healed anyone who came to him and many of them were then healed of their uh, spiritual maladies. It doesn't say all of them, but but that one led to the other. But you also see people come to him, and it doesn't involve uh, a health discussion, meaning a physical healing or even a discussion about food. Uh, Zacchaeus is one that I can think of. Uh, Zacchaeus just, you know, going to his house, yeah, they're going to have lunch. But I can guarantee when Jesus went to his house for lunch, they weren't discussing whether what was on the table was okay or not okay to eat. Uh, because Jesus had previously given instructions to his disciples that said, eat whatever they put before you. Well, that could create quite a crisis if we use our, I'm going to talk about denominationally now, how we, if we use our old approach to health, it became almost as if it were the law of God, that we have to fix everybody's food on their table, that we have to make them eat correctly, or they can't really be part of the kingdom. All of that is false gospel. It's a it's a misplacement of the purpose of health message. So again, you see Jesus uh, and he goes into the heathen communities and he's delivering both miracles, health message, and he's delivering uh, uh, the gospel. But the healing of the soul to eternity was always kept at the forefront. That was the biggest mission Jesus was after. So your question, Ati, what I heard was, Denomination, denominationally, do we need to move to everybody is making a um, health message more prominent than it is um, or has been? I think the gospel needs to be front and center, and we have not been on that. We've been a bit confused on that. We've got a lot of conflicts in our own thinking and teaching on that. That needs to be resolved first so that we know how to utilize the health message to connect with the gospel. Um, we have made mistakes in the past of, even with what I grew up with, not, not in my house, but just uh, in the church environment, of making uh, food uh, a too important of a subject. For instance, is it okay that we say to the guest who's never uh, come to our church before, but they heard we're having potluck and they bring the wrong thing, do we tell them, you know, sorry, you can't serve that here, we can't have that here because it's not on the list of okay things? is our work with them and our attitude and our treatment and our relationship with them uh, suddenly thrown out the window so that we can keep food rules. We have, we have erred on that. And the reason I know that is because, and I didn't know this for a long time, but I, I read where even in Sister White's home, she made changes in her own life for her own health. And um, she didn't force others to make those same changes. She even kept, here's what I'm getting at. She, it says she kept things in her cupboards and in her uh, storage there and would bring them out for guests that she herself had stopped eating. Um, so it, it was never about laws. In fact, it's, 
I think we've misused the word law in relationship to health. Um, if you buy health laws, if what you mean is it's a natural consequence that if you drink beer, you're going to get drunk, it would be useful to call that a law. But if it's health laws, as in these are laws that must be kept so you can get into the kingdom, now we've left the gospel and we've gone on to a false gospel and we need to back up, rewind, get the gospel clear so that when we're using health message, we're using it uh, appropriately. And in, in that, Ati, I think, yes, if every one of us in the denomination could get on that page, using the gospel the way or the health the way Jesus did with the gospel, uh, we would have the 144,000 in action, right? So, so in that way, uh, I think that, yes, that is important that we move in that direction, but we've got to move away from the beating people up and, and making them feel judged and criticized over their food. We need to get more familiar with Romans 14, where it says one man regards one day above another, another all days alike. Uh, one man eats, one man sustains. Who are you to judge another man's servants? And I was reading this morning about in Acts of the Apostles how uh, the disciples were not given any permission to teach the people to judge one servant versus another servant. Uh, that kind of comes in there in the New Testament. So I think we need to move away from all of that and then bless the people. If you got knowledge, like right now, there was kind of a, uh, I think it's a little funny at the moment. I'm going to tattle on my mom for a moment, but I'm going to try it because it might be true. Uh, Schweppes, is it, mom? We we read this thing or she saw this thing about how Schweppes, drinking Schweppes mineral or whatever tonic water right now will actually help kill the COVID. Well, I don't, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a chemist. I can't necessarily figure that out. But if you got knowledge about something that would help somebody really, uh, be cautious about sort of the just the wacky ideas that may not really be helpful because that'll make us look bad but but something that's real Schweppes that thing uh, we might find out that's real uh, but something that's real uh, I, the one I love that my mom's doing is uh, she got a pattern for making masks uh, you know that really keep the virus out the little things we buy at the store the paper ones they're saying those don't really work so Mom is taking time and she's actually sewing. It takes a little while to make one of these things. She's making them for the old ladies across the street and the neighbors and so on. And uh, even the lady I used to work for has asked if I could get my mom to make her one. Um, you know, that's helpful. That's useful things. That's, that's health message as much as uh, not eating so much sugar. Um, but all these things, do them and help the people with them because you're really wanting to show them how much God loves them. You're wanting to tell them how much God loves them. And then everything's in proper perspective. Does that help, Ati? So I just want to back up what you said, uh, Bobby. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, just uh, Romans 14, just adding to what you're talking about, uh, the food and the relation to that of the gospel. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's all. Just wanted to share that. Okay, good. I have uh, one more question. Time, 11.42. Okay, go ahead. Somebody was jumping in. Yeah, I have one more question. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Um, prophetically, we're told that and this is just out of my curiosity that Satan will appear as the great medical missionary <laughs> doing healings and, and stuff like that. Um, what I was thinking about this morning, how do we as God's people respond to all the false revivals and the, and the fallacies of, you know, the miracles that are going on, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a, actually, thank you for bringing that question up, because again, I, I'm, I'm relating this to the 144,000 in action. Will they have to be dealing with that? Absolutely. And how to deal with that? Um, I don't know that I'll take a lot of time to comment on it right now, but let me, let me do a little. Let me say that um, in Great Controversy, a super important chapter in relating to that is the one called uh, Modern Revivals. And in that chapter, you're, there's going to be a lot of... Um, sort of uh, notations of what is false revival versus true. 
And um, in summary, in that chapter, it's going to really relate to everything that is teaching um, God's law, truth about God's law, which means truth about God's character. And, and in relation to him teaching that we are to become law keepers versus just uh, allowing that we're not really getting rid of sin. We're just believing we're going into heaven. Um, I'm just simplifying it a little bit. Um, that's some of, for instance, the big earmarks. And so how will God's people, the 144,000, relate to and deal with that out there? Well, <clears throat> Jesus did a lot of things. Like you notice, he says, you heard it said, but I tell you. Um, and he would use common ones. He didn't go with the extreme oddities of you know, say that the, the, we know the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. He didn't say, well, you heard it said, and then some comment about their really strange off little ideas. He stuck with the mainstream ones, the big ones. Like uh, you heard it said that you're supposed to uh, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. I mean, that that's a central one. <laughs> that That's right to the core of the, the greatest commandment or the true commandments is love Lord your God neighbors yourself. So he would he would deal with the wrong ideas compared to the true ideas. What he didn't do was spend a lot of time with the wrong ideas, meaning detailing them out, because he didn't need to. When he said, you heard it said, he, everybody knew. Yeah, we all heard that. It was very common you know, in their thinking. So he could just kind of refer to it briefly and then, more importantly, lay out what the, what the true version was. And I think as we even deal with the questions of God, God's character, that's an important activity that we're not spending lots of time on all the falsities and all the lists. I mean, you'll never run out of them. There's so many hundreds of different variations of fallacy. But what the people really need is just a slight reference to that to then compare the true. So we are already, we have been seeing, and you're going to see more of false revivals. The most confusing thing on the planet is going to be think of being a, a grown born and raised a jew or israelite in the time of jesus because they believed that their church was the right one it was teaching the right thing it was the only one with the temple it had the um you know all the sacrificial systems going on it believed it was the true one and then here comes jesus and he's teaching things and he's pointing to truths that were solid in scripture but it was in big conflict with their common religious ideas like like Wendell was sharing how just overcoming the common uh, religious thought or belief that that we've had from the past everybody's going to face that doesn't matter if you're Baptist Methodist Adventist the Catholic whatever um, we need to be less distracted on those other groups and what's wrong with them and more distracted on all of us in general and how we're we're off track. This is, I think, back to Daniel's prayer, why he's praying that prayer. So we will have to deal with the false revivals and false miracles. Uh, Ati, I was going to point back to, we did read from Great Controversy about the servants of God with their faces lighted up. But the part I didn't read was at the end, after it says, um, miracles are, will be wrought by the, by the believers or followers of God. The sick will be healed and signs and wonders will follow the believers. The next sentence says, Satan also, with lying wonders, even bringing fire down from heaven in the sight of men, thus the inhabitants will be brought to take their stand. In other words, it's going to be a contest almost in this paragraph between true miracles, and by that I mean everything Charlie was adding to that, miracles of change of heart as well as physical, uh, between true and false. And so for that, our minds should go again back to Mount Carmel, where that same contest was brought up. And now it was even put out there by uh, the, the 144,000 member, uh, that being Elijah, who said, uh, okay, let's do this. Why don't you get an altar going over there and I'll get an altar going here. And then uh, we'll ask and we'll see which one gets fire from heaven. Well, in that story, God prevented satan from being able to be do the appearance of fire from heaven but in the last days according to the verse there that we we're just uh, referring to from revelation and what sister white's talking about is that apparently he'll be allowed to make it appear like fire from heaven i think that's a reference to revival uh meaning 
Um, the false revival is going to look lots of excitement, lots of energy, lots of even power, it says in Great Controversy, uh, lots of teaching, but it's going to be lacking this one thing. It's going to be lacking, this is from the Modern Revivals chapter, it's going to be lacking the sweet love of Jesus Christ. So there'll be lots of religious talk, lots of uh, vehement preaching, but it's going to be absent of that sweet, quiet, peace, love of Jesus Christ. Um, so we will be not only dealing with it from a theoretical point of view, but more importantly, delivering for the people to, to view, to see, to observe uh, the difference between the true and the false revival or altar of Cain and altar of Abel. And um, uh, when that is occurring, that's the fulfillment of that last sentence that says, this is the way that the inhabitants will be brought to take their stand, either fully with God or fully against God. And that stand, that, <clears throat> that uh, contest, that crisis cannot really happen until the 144,000 are marching. That's why I keep coming back to that idea. That needs to happen. And I don't mean you need to run out and orchestrate it. What I mean is you need to give yourself fully to God for him to work in you to do it. Uh, because that, that is the only way the contest is actually going to be brought in front of the people. So thanks for that question, Ati. Any, any other thoughts on that? Um, no, that was, that was good. That was good. Yeah, I was just um, kind of just brought that up because relating to, you know, current events, there are a lot of uh movements to kind of push this into politics and kind of just really you know bring it in to society um in a very how do i put it entertaining forceful way if that makes sense <laughs> sure yeah and i and i and again it's very confusing from a worldly perspective there's lots of questions about all that but i think for god's people uh if we're always just looking for okay lord what's the plan and, and maybe in another way to say, sort of, Lord, what's the opportunity? Because if suddenly my neighbor has questions about either health or peace and safety or, or, or knowledge of God because of it, that, that's where our focus runs to. That's what we want mm -hmm. to be, you know, chasing. And the rest of it, well, we couldn't control it even if we tried. We can't stop it. We can't make it go faster or slower. Um, we can know that the second coming is prepared as the going forth of the morning. It's on a steady pace. We can be assured about that. It's nearer today than it was yesterday. All of that. But, but again, the focus for the 144 or, or the disciples is, yeah, and, and who's wanting to hear a knowledge about God today? Run to them, uh, whether it be starting through a question of health or starting just purely on questions about the end and the afterlife and all those things being able to take all of those things going on around us and turn them to sort of opportunities. That's what the Holy Spirit's working on. And so if we're sort of in tune, that's what it takes to be a disciple after Pentecost, right? Is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then, then that, the guiding of your, of your day and your discussions will be not only built by him, but will be uh, the scenarios will be set up by him. So the person out there who's got the question and then connecting you with them, that is part of that whole work of the Holy Spirit to do that. Um, Bobby, I think uh, just kind of to reiterate what you said, I've, I've felt in, in regards to this question uh, for a while now, the one true safety uh, in, in not being deceived in that time and as you said, that Satan would be allowed to do uh, signs and wonders. The one true safety is in knowing the truth about God's character. <clears throat> because that's the one thing Satan won't be able to counterfeit. He won't have, as the quote you read said, that <clears throat> sweet spirit of Christ. So. Um, so let me say that I had in mind that we could go into uh, the next verses for fun in Revelation, but I'm going to leave that for another time. Uh, and I think I'll just put the word out on this group uh, with all the people that are watching that. Um, if you want to do more details in Revelation or be part of a discussion where we're going to kind of keep focusing on Revelation, uh, if you would let John or Amber 
Let's see. So far, John and Amber kind of send the emails out. Anybody else got people they send the emails out? I guess my mom. Um, if you would let someone know so that we can make sure you get invites to the more discussions that are more on, uh, say, prophecy and prophetic stuff, um, then we'll make sure that we get you those invites. And I'm saying that because next Sabbath, um, at this 10 o'clock, uh, 10, actually we'll start at 10.30 next week. And then for a while on, on that 10.30 time on Sabbath, we will uh, kind of focus, turn our focus a little more to the character of God discussion. Um, not that we're ever leaving that discussion, but uh, kind of more focused on, on that. And, and, and kind of simple how to present the gospel th th that you can present, how, how to get that presented correctly, anything on, on that sort of subject of, of knowing and understanding it as well as sharing it. Um, but then we'll continue other stuff like uh, I would like to do the three angels message a little more in detail and take time to do that. But we'll, we'll schedule a different slot for that. You just let John, Amber, or my mom know that you want to be in on that and we'll make sure you get invites. So today for closing, um, I want to close with a few uh, thoughts out of Christ's object lessons. Just, so just you before you do that, Bobby, yeah, uh, go ahead. Wendell has a comment. Go ahead, Wendell. Oh, um, actually i just put it in chat i didn't want to it was sort of okay. a last point on the hill so you can just look at the chat okay we'll do that <laughs> thank Thanks. you Wendell. uh and and we can work more i was trying to do a quick brief on just gospel and health but we can do more detail on that at another time um so in christ object lessons one you know we started uh, last week uh on the, just looking a little bit of this chapter but i'm going to go to page 415 uh, most of you know this one, but we're going to review it in connection with, again, our, our number of the 144,000. Bobby, where are you at? Sorry. Uh, Christ Object Lessons, page 415. Thank I you. Which one we should start with here? Uh, maybe maybe 4, 414, paragraph 3, starts, the coming of the bridegroom was at midnight. And this is all going to be in relation to the march of the 144,000. So someone, if someone would take that first paragraph and read it for us, that'd be great. Four, 414, paragraph 3, starts the coming of the bridegroom. The, the coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. The days of Noah and Lot pictured the condition of the world just before the coming of the Son of Man. The scriptures <clears throat> pointing forward to this time declare that Satan will work with all power and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. His working is plainly revealed by the rapidly increasing darkness, the multitudinous errors, heresies, and delusions of these last days. Not only is Satan leading the world captive, but his deceptions are leavening the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. The great apostasy will develop into darkness deep as midnight, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. To God's people, it will be a night of trial, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for the truth's sake. But out of that night of darkness, God's light will shine. Okay, so we're starting to crush with the bad news here. I want to just touch on a night of trial. Why a night of trial for God's people? Why, why is this ending going to be a night of trial? I, I don't know if this is what you're thinking or not, but I feel like, at least in my experience, um, whenever i um am am seeing things and get excited about the events that are happening or, or that i want to happen or or whatnot um i might get a little too excited to share and <laughs> the people around me may or may not want to hear what what i'm so excited about and it's always a trial on my heart to, to deal with, I guess, those that I love that don't want the message. 
Okay. So that's connected a little bit to Jesus's weeping, right? He's weeping because they didn't want it. Um, so that's certainly part of the trial. Anything else you can think of? The ones who will turn a bit on the ones who do. <laughs> okay. So the persecution idea, that'll be involved in part of it, right? And that's always uh, hard to deal with. Oh, you know, we naturally want to be loved and accepted, and and that's not that. So that's hard. Um, what else? I have something I could read. Okay. Uh, I think maybe you guys have heard this before, but a great controversy point. Yeah, I'm excited that the people of God seal their testimony with their blood, as did the martyrs before them. They themselves begin to fear that the Lord has left them to fall by the hand of their enemies. It is a time of fearful agony. Day and night, they cry unto God for deliverance. Dot, 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 next paragraph. Could men see with heavenly vision, they would behold companies of angels that excel in strength. They're surrounding the God's people, and yet uh, it says <clears throat> they are waiting the word of their commander to snatch them from their peril. But they must wait a little longer. The people of God must drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism. The very delay is so painful to them is the very best answer to their petitions. Okay, so sort of, again, the extreme persecution element of what will come. Um, well, not, I wasn't, yes, there's the persecution, but not the manifest miracles that had just been happening now they're without those miracles and they're possibly alone in dungeon seemingly abandoned by god and now is their faith in arrest okay god? so it's, trial it's not the faith trial. it's the trial of faith and not direct <laughs> the direct <laughs> hand of god being seen visibly okay. it's it's what has happened in the past that we must rely on good yeah charlie that that reminds me of um how <clears throat> we are refined by the fire and that's really really painful and distressing and yet out of the end of it we we have growth and come to understand god and ourselves more and why the well kelvin did you have something you wanted to comment in there no uh, your question is answered by the rest of the passage here in <laughs> okay tell us explain it to us <laughs> you just finished the finish reading the the passage there the night of persecution for the truth's sake go, go on can and you give me the reference the again darkness. i missed it go ahead uh, you talking about the last sentence but out of that night of darkness god's light will shine okay i'm sorry i closed it up here All right, well, all, all of that is good. All that's true. Just want to <clears throat> pause for a minute because we're going to get on to the most important part here. So I'm going to take the next paragraph and read it for us. He causes the light. He causes, to do this? he causes the light to shine out of darkness. When the earth was out without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So in the night of spiritual darkness, God's word goes forth. Let there be light. To his people, he says, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Behold. Yeah, I, I love how, how it can just connected what we sort of start feeling oh my yeah uh, there is going to be trouble it starts feeling dark and there's going to be crisis and persecution but the the connection there is that yeah and in that darkest hour is when the lord is going to speak into you through you and around you uh to accomplish in this great darkness the light is going to seem be seen more clearly than if it weren't dark right kelvin absolutely I also see I also see that it's kind of a reference to creation and so yep. it's it's referring to his yep. creative power. It's his power, not ours. 
<laughs> right. And he speaks it into existence, huh? Yeah. Isn't that what isn't that what the uh isn't that what the gift of prophecy is for us? I mean, the way I'm 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 reading and hearing these things, it's like that's how God should be working in our daily lives. Or that's this is how this is how our life should be, because you know, as it's as the pattern of the scriptures, you know, it's the world started off in darkness and then God shines his light. But <clears throat> as I'm seeing this, you know, when it pertains to the end times, if if there's no experience of this particularly in our lives, let's say on a well, it should be on a daily basis. <laughs> and <clears throat> just leaning on God's strength and watching him come through. Um, and when the end comes, it's almost like, it's just what it says in Desires of Ages, Jesus couldn't see past the portals of the tomb. But he went in anyway, because he knew, he believed against his feelings and all of his emotions that God would bring him back from the dead. Good. So I think what you're pointing to there is that having that in little ways to learn now helps us get prepared for dealing with that in bigger ways. Like we like to talk about Daniel and the three friends and their, their big trials and their big successes. Uh, but uh, uh, even if all it is is little stuff today, getting you ready for that. Yeah. Peter walking on water uh, and then falling into the water and then getting lifted back out was a uh, sort of almost a small fun practice uh, compared Compared to when the question was, would he deny Christ? And then he failed. But then later, right, then later in his life, now nah, he wasn't failing because of those experiences. So that's that's a, a good good point. Our, you should want your life to have this real now, not not after some other virus or whatever <laughs> starts. That's why I think the answer to the question about, you know, when should this begin? The truth and the true answer is now. Uh, now it should begin. It should begin for anyone who wants to go home after this now and say, Lord, I don't even know what it takes to be part of that, what we're reading about, but I want you to do it in me. I want you to do whatever you got to do to get me ready to be part of that, to be involved in that for tomorrow. Uh, that's a great thing. That's what yesterday I was meaning for those who were uh, with us yesterday uh, talking about we want to pray for it, sing for it, hope for it, believe for it, think for it. It needs to be our, our number one um, interest in life. Now, if it's not that, and we find that, wow, I have too many other interests in life that I actually don't want to let go of in order to have that, don't panic about that. Just say to the Lord, yeah, I see that that's a problem. I love these other things. Can you make those not be so interesting to me so I can be most interested in righteousness? He can fix that. So going on a little more in our, our paragraph here, uh, we're going to get uh, someone to take it. It's a very short one, so take the next one, and so the next two. Behold, it starts, Behold, says the scriptures, and then the one after that. Behold, says the scripture, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the next one? Yeah, go ahead. It is the darkness of this apprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are new, losing the knowledge of his character. Has been misunderstood. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed. A message illuminated. Yeah, and I, I plugged the car in this morning. So um, Maybe. when you start it up, see if there's like 50. Oh, sorry. Then you can get over there. <laughs> it's all right. Go ahead. Back up a little bit there. Was that Kelvin reading? Yeah. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its instant and saving its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. Yeah. We have uh, another question when, when you're ready, Bobby. No, good. That's fine. Go ahead with the question. Okay, Brett, you have a question? 
Uh, yeah, I just had a quick, uh, quick comment um, on that question you had earlier about um, the, uh, what was the uh, what was going on at the very end uh, that that crucible, that final crucible, I guess you'd call it. And I was just uh, thinking, you know, it had to do with the final demonstration. I mean, I think, I think that's what everybody's comments are leading towards: the final demonstration of of um, the character of God. But I, you know, I believe that the ultimate demonstration of the character of God was on the cross. But then there's something more to it at this point. And just like two sentences here in uh, what you were just reading out of uh, Christ's Object Lessons, no man can uh, rightly present the law of God without the gospel, or the gospel without the law. The law is the gospel embodied, and the gospel in the law uh, is the law unfolded. The law, of the, the law is the root. The gospel is the fragrant blossom and fruit which it bears, and it just reminded me that it's the it's the <laughs> it's the ultimate fruit. It's the ultimate fragrant fruit um, that these people are demonstrating. We know that we can be forgiven, but the real question is, can we be healed? And I think that this uh, final crucible and stuff is the ultimate healing of humanity, uh, a demonstration that yes, the cross can heal ultimately humanity and where all those questions that people get confused on at the end time well you know what's the 140,000 you know are they perfect what's perfection all this other kind of stuff but i would just like to say that it, it looks like to me it appears that it is the ultimate fragrant fruit of the healing of the gospel and the law unfolded good good thoughts <clears throat> thanks for that reading too that's that's a good one um because that is really where we're headed right is that Ultimately, we need to understand that the last message is about the character of God's love and what it's supposed to accomplish. And this is where the connection of the 144,000 is. What it's supposed to accomplish is transforming people into Christ likeness, which is, uh, I think, the same thing that that reading was saying. And so this part here about understanding, this is most important for those who will be part of this work. The gospel work to understand that the real crisis is the misapprehension of God, the wrong understanding of God. That's the biggest thing. That's first and foremost. So every other part of the discussion we could have on all the details about the 144, most important is to understand they are the disciples for the end. They are those who will follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And what I mean by that is, like the disciples, they went and heard what He said. They watched what he did, and they started to match their lives to his. And, and that's that fragrant fruit that um, uh, I forgot who was speaking, but uh, Brett, Brett was saying about that fragrant fruit. And that is what will reveal to the world. The 144 is just a number uh, that is used to represent that there will be those people on the earth. And it's not going to be, they're not going to be arguing and discussing about who's perfect. Uh, they're not going to be comparing between each other who's perf more perfect than the other. Anybody discussing that won't be part of that <laughs> because those people will be saying that they, like Paul, are the chief among sinners. They'll be in Daniel's prayer praying, uh, Lord, how we have turned against thee, and their repentance will be heartfelt because what they want more than anything is for God to work in them to represent the truth to those around them. That's going to be their focus. That'll be their activity. That'll be their love. That'll be what they want to be talking about and doing. For instance, uh, just in contrast to that, I wanted to think about, you know, we know the story about the, the Pharisees and how they taught the Sabbath law, right? So they were educated on the law. And then there's the guy that Jesus told to carry the mat around. And so the Pharisees found that guy carrying his mat around and it says they threw him out of the temple. Like they, they dis, disfellowshipped him or excommunicated him. Boom, just right that day. When we read that story, do we think that the Pharisees were teaching the law correctly? We know they weren't. We see how they thought they were teaching the law, but in fact, they were trampling on the law. Uh, they might've been using a quote out of the Old Testament scriptures that was correct, but the very handling of that scripture and the way they dealt it out to the people and the way they treated the people, they were the worst lawbreakers in the story, uh, in, in, on the earth at that time, <laughs> even worse than straight out 
sort of heathen uh, bow down to idol people. Um, and I think that we, we is part, part of understanding this true gospel is it isn't just about quoting the law. It is about knowing the law intimately, that's Jesus, so that that law is written in the heart and that what comes out of us, what comes out of you is the right character of God as you offer to the people, not beat them over the head, as you offer them a knowledge about God, which includes his law. Uh, we fall in love with the law. We have no crisis with the law and we can present it in a way that gives the law beauty. I can tell you, I've had experience with, um, for instance, sharing the Sabbath law, uh, the fourth commandment, uh, in a way, it took me a while to learn it that way, but in a way that when I was sharing it with uh, people who were not Sabbath keepers, um, they they acknowledged really quickly that, yeah, actually the Bible doesn't say the Sabbath was ever changed. They were telling me. I didn't have to tell them that. And I was like, oh, see, they know that. And then they were telling me that, um, that uh, they had never heard it presented in a way that wasn't in conflict with what they thought was raised by faith. In other words, if we present the Sabbath or the third commandment or the fifth commandment in a way that's really righteous as by works. Again, we're destroying the law, but present righteous by faith and the joy of having even the fourth commandment written on your heart. Uh, I I've seen others who didn't believe in any value in the fourth commandment uh, have tears, just break down and have tears over how wonderful that was. They said, how come, you guys never explained that to us before, one said to me. I'm like, well, that's a good question. I just learned it. I couldn't explain it to you the day before. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, so there is something that happens when the right character of God is understood, dwells in the heart, and then all of these other subjects, whether it be health or, or fourth commandment or other things, how they will shine with beauty that uh, someone earlier said, yeah, I don't think we've seen this yet. We do need to see it. It's forthcoming. God's developing and building it and that's why our our conclusion here in Christ's object lessons about it is the darkness and the misapprehension of God that's the big problem so pray for knowledge and wisdom on how to help with that small ways it doesn't have to be big run out uh have you know thousand people at your meeting kind of activity Jesus did it one person by one person by one person and yeah he did have to speak to groups now and again but his favorite was connecting with one person, a heart connection where he was healing their leprosy and then representing to them the gospel or whatever. So with that, I think we'll uh, bring it to a close today. We got a few minutes more. We promised we'd put it at 1230. So anybody else want to chime in, add anything? I'll be quiet and let you. Wendell has a comment. Hey, so just the idea, the concept of law, the way it sounds and, um, the connotation of it is generally negative and it, it kind of sort of pushes people um, to go the other way. You tell me go right, I go left. I cannot do this, you know, whatever it is. Okay, I'll, I'll do double of that, you know. But um, I think what's helpful is to understand that um, a, maybe a good understanding of law is just, it's a simple way of um, explaining how things work. And if I go see my doctor, I, you know, I mean, he can tell me the pathology and the physiology of what's going on. Um, and he can explain the laws to me, but basically he, he does best to explain how I can get better and what I need to do, what the treatment plan is for me to get better. And inside of that, all of that is packed uh, what the laws of health are, you know? And so, uh, th this has been a fantastic way for me to communicate with my nuclear physicist uncle because we can talk about the laws of thermodynamics and, and all of that, but it, it all comes down to how stuff works. It's, it's, it's just by design and it's causal. It, you know, you run into Galatians 6, 7, you, that sort of thing, you know, it, it, you're reaping and sowing and sowing and reaping and, and that kind of thing. So anyways, it, just a thought there because... Uh, I don't have an SDA background, but we had lots of rules, and I loved to break all of them, and I did. <laughs> That's true. I was such a rebellious yeah. person. That's I so see true. your dad laughing over there, too. That is true. <laughs> well, that's that's so true, Wendell. That that if you're going to have a seminar downtown and invite just you know everybody off the street to come, 
uh, if you call it the seminar on the, the, you know, the law of God, you probably won't have a whole lot show up, right? Yeah. But if you have a seminar on uh, the character of God, uh, people go, wait, what's that? Like, were we even supposed to think about that, right? And so I've had a lot of people show up to something we call, but we're, for us, we know we're talking about the same thing. When we talk about God's character, we're really talking about God's law and vice versa. But, you, you know, if you put it on the, the bulletin board, that's probably true. That you, not too many will show up. <laughs> we got uh, another question from uh, Ati. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the the idea of the misapprehension of God. Um, growing up, some of y'all can relate. <laughs> Growing up on the islands in Hawaii, you know, we were raised a certain way. Um, you know, if if you if you disobeyed, you know, you get love it. taps. <laughs> but um, for me, growing up, that was that was my parents' view of how, you know, God wanted them to raise their kids. If that makes sense, and for me, that was my motivation for, you know, obeying my parents and just following the rules was to avoid punishment. And then as I grew up in my own spiritual walk, that later on became my motivation to believe in God was to avoid this punishment. And so by the time I left and moved out of my home, <clears throat> you know, all the discipline went out the window. I'm doing my own thing and all this different stuff. And I'm over here. Yeah, 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 yeah. God loves me. But it wasn't until I, I understood that, you know, God wanted us to obey him, not to gain something or fear of punishment, just, but simply because we love him and we understand, you know, how he is as a father, as a God, as the Bible calls him to be. And, you know, I later on got into teaching and I, I started to implement this in how I approach students. Ah, you know, I worked in a very rough area and a lot of students came in and that was their motivation. Mister, I'm here just cause, just so my mom won't whoop me, <laughs> you know, and all that stuff in nine yards. But, you know, just approaching people and, you know, not having that idea that, shoot, I better do this or else something bad is going to happen to me versus, you know, knowing who God is and actually wanting to do what's right, actually wanting to, you know, live the right life. It really comes from really just knowing God. Good. We have a uh, God wants us Brett. to grow out of that. Go ahead, Brett. Oh, hi. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, regards to earlier when you were talking about um, <laughs> the health message and you know the coronavirus, uh, et cetera. Um, I think you know everybody has looked and have seen different things on Facebook. You know. Uh, sliced lemon with hot water the uh you know the different breathing exercises the uh the garlic the you know et cetera, et cetera. um you know i think it's always like you know you're trying to say god is love you know really the the succinct um comment of of that what everybody was getting up to what does this mean you know on that uh final uh demonstration is basically the three words that ellen white uses at the beginning and end of her books is god is love but there's an there's a there's a demonstration there, and there's an explanation uh, for the last thousands of years about what does that mean? <laughs> explain. It. We know we know what you say that God is love, but explain it so that it makes sense and demonstrate it. Uh, what's interesting on the the coronavirus, um, you know, uh, ways to prevent it and stuff. I uh, understood myself, you know, well, you know, you take um, zinc and uh, vitamin D and this NAC, uh, N-acetylcysteine NAC, supplement, but not knowing and understanding what was behind that. And so explaining what's behind that uh, is, is also like, you know, explaining what's behind God is love so that it makes sense to people. I found that uh, the most impressive by far uh, uh, way to prevent coronavirus that makes sense was uh, Neil Nedley's um, uh, YouTube video. He has quite a few of them, but his one that's titled Neuroimmunology and Stress, Overcoming Stress During the uh, Trying Times. Uh, he is 
very, very smart. He's been doing this for a long time. And this hour and a half uh, video, the first hour of it uh, talks about, you know, the different foods, the different chemical compounds, how stress, uh, oxidation stress, and how this affects uh, these different uh, disease processes that the coronavirus put you through. Um, and he even explains why the NAC supplement works and the zinc and the ion channels and everything else so that it makes sense. And he has a 30 minute uh, question and answer program at the end. It's about, uh, it was on two days ago. And if anybody's interested in um, really uh, what I think is very, very superior to what's out there, an explanation and very good uh, advice on uh, this um, defeating this virus or whatever. You know, that also being said that you have to have more faith in God than you do the virus, of course. Um, so <laughs> by beholding, that may uh, be some advice. But again, I would just uh, stress that this video is, is, is very, very good, and, and it's, a, it's a very godly presentation. So if anybody's interested, the title is Neuroimmunology and Stress, Overcoming uh, Stress During Trying Times by Dr. Neil Nedley. He's the uh, president of Weimar Institute in Northern California. I just wanted to make that plug because I thought it was just absolutely incredible. Thank you, Brett. Appreciate that. Anyone else have a, a last comment or thought? All right. Well, I guess. Oh, I go ahead, Brett. I kind of have a question. Um, so when we were reading Great Controversy 612.1, and we were talking about the miracles that would be wrought. Um, and then right after that, it mentioned Satan would also work some of his works and wonders, lying wonders, it says, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. And I feel like I've heard that before where he'll heal, you know, heal people. I don't know exactly by what power it made me think about Jesus, when he was casting out demons and, you know, the, whoever was there was like, he's casting out demons because he's the father of demons or whatever. And he's like, well, a kingdom divided about against itself can't stand. And it almost sounds like at the end of time, Satan really is going to do that in some sense. And it's like, is he, is it fake healings? Is it like, like in Egypt, when, when the whatever magicians or whatever threw their staffs down, it wasn't really creating snakes. It was just similar kind of, but it wasn't the real deal. Um, I don't know. Like, uh, that's a great question, Barb. And um, there's, there is a bunch to read, and we probably should do a more thorough discussion on it at a different time, but I will say, yeah, you're on the right track, especially this thing with Egypt, um, because, and that's probably what you remember from reading about that in, um, in Patriots and Prophets, but uh, there was a difference between God turning a stick, an actual stick, into a snake, that's creative power, that's power of creation, uh, versus the uh, what they call them, the magicians or whatever, uh, Pharaoh's magicians, uh, taking snakes and making them appear like sticks and then changing them back and forth. So the devil, um, we do know uh, from Sister White's writings that the devil is going to take even control of nature. Uh, he's going to be given control of nature in ways that maybe God didn't allow before. Um, and with the calamities uh, that he can create with his power and through humans, uh, science and uh, technology and all the things that he might be able to help humanity develop. All of the, part of the interesting part is all of the calamities and disasters and whatnot are gonna be actually caused by that, not by God. Uh, God will be able to do real miracles in the sense of taking something that was dead and giving it life, taking something that was really cancer and fixing it, um, really blind and fixing it. We're told the devil cannot do those things. But to Pharaoh, he couldn't tell the difference between the magicians and what they did and Moses and what he did. That's why the contest had to keep increasing. So, you know, think about being Moses and, and so God tells you, okay, go in there and throw your stick down. And he had, you know, seen that already. So he did it and, and yep, it worked. 
But maybe what Moses didn't see coming was, oh, and then those guys are going to be able to fool Pharaoh thinking they're doing miracles too. And how's Moses going to have a discussion or a presentation that's going to prove to Pharaoh that his miracles are real and theirs is false? Yeah, it's not going to be difficult. In fact, it's good that he didn't even try. Uh, what he did is he went back home, you know, after that little activity and just asked God, okay, well, what's the plan next? And then God ratchets the contest up until pretty soon, I think it was the first three miracles in Egypt, uh, Pharaoh, it appeared to Pharaoh that his magicians could do the same thing. But then after that, pretty soon, his magicians, it's not working anymore. And Moses didn't even have to worry about how to fix that discussion or dilemma he just kept doing what god said to do and pretty soon what god and moses were doing was untouchable by the others and it got proven even to pharaoh that no this god was alive and had power and they were we don't know what they were doing but theirs was shallow and cheap and fake so in the end i can't answer details for you about how the people are going to be able to tell the difference between Satan and his false miracles versus God's servants. I think it, the first important thing to know is that both are going to be happening. And the reason I say that is because I grew up um, where I was trained learning that no, God's not going to do miracles because Satan's going to be doing them. And that's not a correct answer. It's actually Satan trying to keep up with and, 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 present to the people his version of what God is doing, his deception. But how will that be ultimately overcome for the planet? Um, that'll be interesting to see how God's going to do that, but he is going to do it. It will start being where it becomes clear that, that those things over there are not real. But don't fall into the pit of thinking we have to explain to everybody how to tell the difference between the true and the false. Moses didn't do that. So that much I'll say for now and, and say that there's there's much more to dig into on that one. Uh, but um, very, very helpful thought and question. Okay, so we've arrived at 1230. Uh, again, the, the meeting is a public thing. Y'all can stay as long as you want and chat, but I promised I would quit at 1230. And uh, so I'll do that and uh, let everybody get some lunch. And uh, so next Sabbath, again, just uh, so that it, it's clear, next Sabbath, 1230, uh, we will uh, turn our focus to more of the details on the gospel, the questions of the gospel, and how to present. And then um, we'll make another meeting time uh, for those, anybody who wants to work further on, on prophecy questions and details. But thank you for joining us today, for adding in to the discussion. I uh, love it when you bring quotes to add in to what we're already working on. Even if it's quotes that you're saying, hey, well, this one sounds like it's saying something different. How do you explain that? Throw that in there. We like that. And uh, thanks to all those at River's Edge, if anybody joined us from there. Um, I guess, John, uh, should we say anything um, to the people that joined us from River's Edge that if they wanted to be in on the conversation, there's a way for them to join on Zoom and not just have to be silent listeners or? You're talking about on uh, uh, next Sabbath? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, it's it's on Zoom and um, I post the Zoom uh, meeting link in the River's Edge uh, Facebook group. Well, thank um, you but, from there. Yeah, but also if you wanna send me your email, I can send links via email. Um, looks like maybe we have a, a parting thought from Wendell, and then uh, and then we'll close with prayer. Okay. This is to, I think it was Barb's um, question about miracles, false miracles, that sort of thing. So I, I think one important consideration is um, what establishes the truth, right? You, you have this... Uh, you know, this kind of working idea of um, God shows up and then people get to decide, right? Romans 14, 5, that each one be persuaded on his own, right? Make up your own mind, that kind of thing. And so if we, if we think through a little bit about whether miracles validate some kind of thing, truth or whatever it is, someone chatted in, in the comment section about watching a Benny Hinn crusade and see how that works. And I have first um, hand testimony as to 
many things I've seen and I've seen things after the miracle that made me scratch my head like, wow, what was that about? So it sort of pulled me one way when I, when I thought, well, this was good, but maybe it wasn't so good after all, whatever. Um, but the idea of establishing truth, right? And I'll ask Uncle Bob this question. Uh, was it Elijah or Elisha who had um, experienced these incredible things with, with God, all these demonstrations, like big Cecil B. DeMille type of thing, epic type of types of demonstration and then after that came the small still voice that was very comforting and and that really spoke to him was it one of the two elijah or elisha yes okay so any anyway so to that right graham maxwell is going to say that um the devil has no truth in him so what does he do because it's not in him he has to manipulate he has to do stuff to to get our attention and i think um uh th that's an that's an issue that um the mechanism of uh of how power works right because w another thing to consider too is that um god's kingdom is not like man's kingdom and and in that famous um, verse in Zechariah, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So we, we say, well, does God need to establish or validate himself as the supreme creator, the one voice, the ultimate originator of everything unborrowed and all of that through miracles or any of that? Or, or, just, or does he just say, well, you know, allow my love through my messengers to, to uh, speak and to give testimony and you can see nature right you got the book of nature and 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 that sort of thing so it, it's a little bit of an existential exercise but to me the question is what validates truth and does it take a miracle for me to have something verified or validated good good thought all I right see, i see my friends debbie and ken on there uh i just noticed them i've Trying to figure out how to see all the screens here. Ken, <laughs> would you mind having closing prayer for us? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for all your blessings. Thank you that we could gather together and discuss your goodness and your grace. We pray that you'll continue to guide us and help us to have a good afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, thanks and happy Sabbath to you all, and we'll see you next week. Hey, Bobby, you just to clarify, I yeah, think you ahead. said twelve thirty next uh, Sabbath, but you meant sorry, 10, 10, 10 thirty, yeah, ten thirty. Okay, thank you. John, John will get it correct on the email that goes out. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll see. we'll see you guys after a little later. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye.